created me a clean heart. Oh, oh, oh yeah. And renew a right spirit within me. Oh, oh, yeah. And renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence. Oh, Clean heart, heart, oh yeah, and renew a right spirit within me. Create in me a clean heart, oh, oh my God. And renew the right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, Yahweh, and take not your The joy of your salvation and renew a right spirit within me. Restore unto me the simple joy of your salvation and renew a right spirit within me ready to get into y'all's word today. I am as well. I want you to open your Bibles with me to Leviticus chapter 23, and we're going to begin with verse 26, 
in just a moment, and I've entitled this message today, Yom Kippurim, a prophetic picture of the priesthood of Messiah. So we know that all of the fall feasts picture what Yeshua is going to do when he returns at his second appearing. And so Yom Kippurim pictures the judgment that is to come just before he enters into his millennial kingdom. And of course, it's a wonderful thing that we who are his bride will be with him. He is going to rule and reign upon this earth for 1,000 years of shalom. And we will be right there with him in Jerusalem. Amen. But today, I wanted to talk more about the prophetic picture that Yom Kippurim is and how it pictures Yeshua as the eternal high priest. And there's so much to be said about that. I think you'll really be encouraged by the message today. But we're going to begin with Leviticus 23 and verse 26. It says, And Yah spoke to Moshe, saying, On the tenth day of this seventh new moon, or the seventh biblical month, is Yom Ha Kippurim. All right, Yom being the day, the day of Kippurim, the day of coverings. It shall be a set-apart gathering to you. That's a mikrah. That means a rehearsal. We're rehearsing what Yeshua is going to accomplish when he returns. And you shall afflict your beings. All right. Now, the rabbis teach, and most people believe that that's talking about fasting and prayer. So we're supposed to humble ourselves and pray and fast. And shall bring an offering made by fire to Yah. Well, our offerings now are spiritual offerings. So this is a day of singing and rejoicing and dancing and praying and fasting and all of the spiritual things that we do. We can bring an offering to the master. Verse 28 says, And you do no work on that same day. So this day of Yom Kippurim is called the Sabbath of Sabbaths. All right, so it is a special high Sabbath. It is the most set-apart day on the biblical calendar. It says, For it is Yom Kippurim to make atonement or a covering for your sins for you before Yah your Elohim. Verse 29, For any being who is not afflicted on that same day, he shall be cut off from his people. Now, we don't obey the scripture now because we're afraid of the death penalty. We obey the scripture because we love the one who paid our death penalty. It's a huge difference. In the new covenant, we have a different motivation. Our motivation for obeying the scripture is love. We are so thankful for the one who came and took our sins upon himself and died in our place and paid our death penalty. We are so thankful for that that we want to obey the scripture in love. Because Yeshua said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Amen? All right. Look at verse 30. And any being who does any work on that same day, that being I shall destroy from the midst of his people, you do no work, a law forever throughout your generations in all your dwellings. It is a Sabbath of rest to you. and You shall afflict your beings. On the ninth day of the new moon at evening, from evening to evening, you observe your Sabbath. Now, I want to take a little side journey for a moment and show you an interesting passage that maybe uh, you haven't seen or hadn't come to your attention as of yet. And people do debate about whether or not we're supposed to fast on Yom Kippurim. You've heard it called Yom Kippur as well. And uh, there's an interesting passage in the book of Acts that gives us the impression that the writer of the book of Acts, Luke, uh, as well as Paul and, and all of the early believers, understood Yom Kippurim as a fast day. All right, a day for fasting. Acts chapter 27, verse 9. And much time having passed, and the sailing now being dangerous, because the fast was already over. Now, there's no doubt that Luke is speaking of Yom Kippurim. So we have Luke and we have Paul and we have the early believers recognizing Yom Kippurim as a fast day. So that ought to help us in, you know, when we are listening to all the debates about whether we ought to be fasting. We certainly ought to humble ourselves. We certainly ought to be fasting and we ought to be praying on this special day. Can you say amen? 
All right, Leviticus chapter 16 and verse 2. Let's get into the Yom Kippurim service. You know, what did Aharon do on this special day? And as we're reading through this and pointing out certain points and dynamics, I want you to be thinking about Yeshua and how Aharon and this service actually pointed to Yeshua. It pictures Yeshua. All right? Leviticus chapter 16, verse 2. And Yah said to Moshe, Speak to Aharon, that's Aaron, your brother, not to come in at all times to the set-apart place inside the veil. All right, that's the most set-apart place, or what's called the Holy of Holies. In other words, he's not to come in just any time he wants to. All right? Speak to Aharon, your brother, not to come in at all times to the set-apart place inside the veil before the lid of atonement, which is on the ark. That's the lid of the ark of the covenant lest he die, because I appear in the cloud above the lid of atonement. All right, the scripture says, no man shall see Yah and live. Verse 3, with this, Aharon should come into the set-apart place. So it's happening one time a year on Yom Kippurim, and this is how he comes, with the blood of a young bull as a sin offering. So this is the day that the high priest offers a sin offering. Actually, there are more than one, and of a ram as an ascending offering. He should put on the set-apart linen long shirt. Now, all of these clothing items are white linen. All right, This is different from the golden ceremonial garments that the high priest would wear on the Sabbaths and the new moons and other feast days. On Yom Kippurim, he is to wear all white linen garments. Now, if your mind is thinking and you're, you're thinking about Yeshua, you know that this represents the sinlessness of Yeshua, who is our high priest. So he should put on the set-apart linen long shirt with linen trousers on his flesh and gird himself with a linen girdle and be dressed with a linen turban. They are set-apart garments, and they're all white. All right, they're all white. And he shall bathe his body in water and shall put them on. And from the congregation of the children of Israel, he takes two male goats. Everybody say two male goats. Two male goats. Keep this in mind as we are going through this. Two male goats as a sin offering and one ram as an ascending offering. And Aharon shall bring the bull as a sin offering, which is for himself. So he's first going to make an atonement for himself and his household, and ultimately the priesthood, okay? And Aharon shall bring the bull as a sin offering, which is for himself, and make atonement for himself and for his house. Verse 7, and he shall take the two goats and let them stand before Yah at the door of the tent of appointment, and Aharon shall cast lots for the two goats, one lot for Yah and the other lot for Azazel. So he's going to cast lots. He's going to place a lot upon each one of the goats. One will be for Yah and the other is for Azazel. All right, the one for Yah is going to be a, a sin offering and his blood is going to be shed. And the one for Azazel is going to be the scapegoat where all of the sins of the people will be loaded on that goat and it's going to be driven out into a desolate place to die. All right, let's look at verse 9. And Aharon shall bring the goat on which the lot fell for Yah and shall prepare it as a sin offering, a sin offering for all the people. But the goat on which the lot fell for Azazel is caused to stand alive before Yah to make atonement upon it to send it into the wilderness to Azazel again this is the scapegoat verse 11 and Aharon shall bring the bull of the sin offering which is for himself all right I need you to keep this in mind he's going to offer a bull as a sin offering for himself and make atonement for himself and for his house and shall slay the bull as the sin offering which is for himself. 
So he's going to gather up the blood in a basin. He's going to have an assistant stir it to keep it from coagulating. He's going to come back and get it in a bit. Verse 12. And shall take a fire holder filled with burning coals of fire from the slaughter place before Yah with his hands filled with sweet incense, beaten fine, and shall bring it inside the veil. So he's going to enter into the most set-apart place, but the first thing he's going to have to do is fill the, the most set-apart place with a cloud of incense. And so that's the very first thing that he does when he enters in to the most set-apart place behind the veil is that he puts the incense on the coals and it fills that whole entire room with a cloud, with smoke. Verse 13, And he shall put the incense on the fire before Yah, and the cloud of incense shall cover the lid of atonement, which is on the witness, again, the Ark of the Covenant, lest he die. Now, remember, the Almighty said, I'm going to make an appearance. I'm going to show up on that lid between the wings of the cherubim. And the scripture says in Exodus chapter 33, verse 20, that no man shall see Yah and live. And so what is Aharon doing? He's making a smoke screen. I mean, he's, he's covering that room. He's filling that room with smoke. And uh, he is not going to haphazardly gaze upon the Almighty when he's in that room. Verse 14, and he shall take some of the blood of the bull. So he goes back out, he gets the blood of the bull and sprinkle it with his finger on the lid of atonement on the east side. So he sprinkles some of the blood on the east side of the lid of the Ark of the Covenant. He also sprinkles blood in front of the lid of atonement. He sprinkles some of the blood with his finger seven times. All right. So with that, he's completed the sin offering for himself and his household, including the priests. Verse 15. And he shall slay the goat of the sin offering. You remember the goat where the lot fell for Yah? Which is for the people and shall bring its blood inside the veil. And shall do with that blood as he did with the blood of the bull. So he's going to repeat that process. And sprinkle it on the lid of atonement. And in front of the lid of the atonement. Which was likely on the veil itself. So he's going to sprinkle the blood of the, of the goat on the east side of the lid of atonement. He's also going to sprinkle the blood of the goat in front of the lid. Which is most likely on the veil itself. Verse 16. And he shall make atonement. For the set apart place, because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel, and because of their transgressions in all their sins. And so he does for the tent of appointment, which is dwelling with them in the midst of their uncleanness. And no man should be in the tent of appointment when he goes in to make atonement in the set apart place until he comes out. And he shall make atonement for himself and for his household and for all the assembly of Israel. All right. Now, let's look at verse 20. And this talks about the scapegoat. Now, these are all important things. And I know sometimes it's laborious reading. I really want you to follow it because when we get into the apostolic writings, especially the book of Hebrews, we start reading about Yeshua, our high priest. He fulfills all these things. All these things point to him. Leviticus chapter 16, verse 20. And when he has finished atoning for the set-apart place and the tent of appointment and for the slaughter place or for the altar, he shall bring the live goat, the one the lot fell for Azazel, the scapegoat. Verse 21. Then Aharon shall lay both his hands on the head of the live goat and shall confess over it all the crookednesses of the children of Israel in all their transgressions, in all their sins, and shall put them on the head of the goat, and shall send it away into the wilderness by the hand of a fit man. And so Aharon lays his hands, both hands, upon the scapegoat, and he lays the crookednesses of the children of Israel, their transgressions, their sins, upon this goat. And this goat then 
is going to carry away the sins of the people into a desolate place. He's going to go out in the wilderness to die. He's carrying away the sins of the people. Verse 23, Aharon shall then come into the tent of appointment and shall take off the linen garments which he put on when he went into the set-apart place and shall leave them there. So he's taking off the all-white garments. Verse 24, and he shall bathe his body in water in the set-apart place and shall put on his garments and shall come out and prepare his ascending offering and the ascending offering of the people and make atonement for himself and for the people and burn the fat of the sin offering on the slaughter place. All right, so now we're going to talk about what they did with the bodies of the sin offerings. All right, you remember the bull? That was offered for the high priest and for his household and for the priests. And then the goat that was offered for all the people. What do they do with the bodies of those offerings? Look at verse 27. And the bull for the sin offering and the goat for the sin offering, whose blood was brought in to make atonement in the set-apart place, is brought outside the camp. Everybody say, outside the camp. And this is very important, so keep this in mind when we start studying about Yeshua and how he fulfilled all these things. And they shall burn their skins and their flesh and their dung with fire. And this is a law forever, the scripture tells us. Well, if it's a law forever, we shouldn't forget about it, should we? We shouldn't allow religion to tell us that it's insignificant, and that we don't need to pay attention to it. If the Almighty says it's a law forever, you say, well, it's just for Israel. But I thought when you believed in Yeshua, you were grafted in to believing Israel. Is that true? When you believe in Yeshua, are you grafted in to believing Israel? Are you a part of the tree of Israel? All right, it's a law forever. Verse 29, and this shall be for you a law forever. In the seventh new moon, in the seventh biblical month, on the tenth day of the new moon, you afflict your beings... You humble yourself, you fast and pray, and you do no work. The native, that's the native-born Israelite, or the stranger who sojourns among you. All right, so the gare who joins himself to the people. The scripture says can draw near as if he was a native of the land. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And this is really speaking of those of us who are not ethnic Israel, or at least we don't know if we are. <laughs> who when we believe in Yeshua, we are grafted in, we draw near, and we become as natives of the land. Verse 30, for on that day he makes atonement for you to cleanse you, to be clean from all your sins before Yah. All right, look at verse 31. It is a Sabbath of rest for you, and you shall afflict your beings a law forever, and the priest who is anointed and ordained to serve as priest in his father's place shall make atonement and shall put on the linen garments, the set-apart garments, and he shall make atonement for the most set-apart place and make atonement for the tent of appointment and for the slaughter place or for the altar and make atonement for the priests and for all the people of the assembly. And this shall be for you a law forever to make atonement for the children of Israel for all their sins once a year, and he did as Yah commanded Moshe. All right, so this is saying that all of the high priests after Aharon, they're to do the same thing every year. It's a law forever. Amen? All right, so you say, well, that was a bit laborious. All right, but we had to lay down the groundwork so that you could understand what the writer of Hebrews is actually saying when he's talking about Yeshua. You've heard me say many, many times that if you don't have a foundation in the Torah, and the Torah is the foundation of all Scripture, then when you get into the apostolic writings and you get into a, a hard or a difficult passage, you don't know what to do with it. You end up making stuff up. And that's what religion has done because it does not have a foundation in the Torah. Now that I've laid a foundation for you concerning what's to take place on Yom Kippurim, now when we read the book of Hebrews about Yeshua, you're going to say, oh, that's why that says what it says. 
All right, so let's go to Hebrews chapter 8. We're going to begin with verse 1, and we're going to first lay down the groundwork that in Yeshua, we have a better covenant that's based on better promises. All right, it says, now the summary of what we are saying is, we have such a high priest, speaking of Yeshua, who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the greatness in the heavens. All right, so this is Yeshua seated at the right hand of Elohim. All right, they don't get any greater than Yeshua. Amen. You can look at Aharon, you can appreciate what he did, you can be thankful for his ministry, but there are no high priests greater than Yeshua, the great high priest. Amen. Look at verse 2. And who serves in the set-apart place and of the true tent which Yah set up and not man. So he's speaking of the tabernacle in heaven. So we have a high priest. His name is Yeshua. He serves in the temple or the tabernacle that's in the heavenlies. People say, well, what about all those commands in the Torah that pertain to the priesthood and the temple and the altar and the sacrifices? Haven't all of those been abolished? And what I would say to that is, no, they haven't been abolished. They've been exalted. In other words, they're being fulfilled by our high priest, our great high priest, who's still doing the service. He's doing the service in the tabernacle, in the heavenlies. So he satisfies all of those requirements in the Torah. Amen. No one has the right to abolish anything in the Torah. The, the Torah is eternal, only the Almighty. And the Almighty said that he gives all authority to Yeshua. Yeshua had the authority to, but he didn't. Amen. And Shaul, or the Apostle Paul, Shaul followed Yeshua. He said, if you imitate me, you will be imitating Yeshua. He taught in another place, if anyone teaches anything different or in disagreement than the sound words of Yeshua, withdraw from that person. And that standard would apply to himself as well. So if Shaul or the Apostle Paul ever taught anything different than Yeshua taught, if he ever taught anything that was in disagreement with the sound words, this is Shaul speaking, he says all sound doctrine comes from Yeshua. With the sound words of Yeshua Messiah, he says, if you hear that from anyone, the implication is, including me, withdraw from that person. So this idea that Yeshua was under the law and taught people under the law, and we're not under the law, so we shouldn't listen to Yeshua, that cannot be substantiated in the scripture. Amen. Shaul never said that. Shaul would preach a fiery message of, of condemnation against religion today knowing what religion is doing Amen. pitting the teachings of Yeshua against the teachings of Shaul Shaul never did that can you say amen, amen. Hallelujah. hallelujah and so Yeshua is our great high priest it says in another place a our faithful high priest and what is he doing he ever lives to make intercession for us now if you don't understand what that means you're thinking he's a up there in, in heaven praying for everybody. No, what is he doing? He is doing what a high priest does. He's doing his priestly duties on behalf of the people of Elohim. Can you say amen? There is a tabernacle in the heavenlies. There is a priest. His name is Yeshua. There is an offering. Yeshua himself is the offering. And all of the commandments in the Torah that pertain to the tabernacle and to the priesthood and to the altar and the sacrifices have been exalted in Yeshua. And he's satisfying every one of them. Hallelujah. 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 All right, look at verse 4. For if indeed he, Yeshua, were on earth, he would not be a priest, since there are priests who offer the gifts according to the Torah, speaking of the Levitical priesthood. Notice who serve a copy and shadow of the heavenly. So I have to ask the question, which ministry, which priesthood is superior? 
The one that's the copy or the shadow or the one that's in heaven? Absolutely. Now, we're not taking away anything from the eternal priesthood that's been given to, to Levi. But some people put such an emphasis on the Levitical priesthood and they forget about the priesthood of Yeshua in the heavenlies. Because the Levitical priesthood on earth pointed to Yeshua. It was mentioned today in the, in the Torah portion that if a person read the Torah and obeyed the Torah, the Torah would lead that person to Yeshua. The Levitical priesthood leads people to our great high priest who is Yeshua. Can you say amen? Who serve a copy and a shadow of the heavenly. As Moshe was warned when he was about to make the tent or the tabernacle, the earthly tabernacle, for he said, Elohim said, see that you make all according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. That was the heavenly pattern. That's Exodus chapter 25 and verse 40. So the Almighty told Moshe, you don't get any artistic license with this tabernacle. I'm not asking you to sit down and draw up some sketches. I don't need your opinion about what this is supposed to look like. This is supposed to be a picture, a shadow of what already exists in the heavenlies. So you make it exactly according to the pattern that I showed you on the mountain. Amen. Well, fortunately, he did. He made it just the way the Almighty showed him. And when he did, what happened? The glory of the Almighty came and filled the place. For he said, Elohim said, see that you make all according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. But now he, speaking of Yeshua, has obtained a more excellent service. So you could say a more excellent priesthood. So who's got the greater priesthood? Yeshua. Inasmuch as he is also mediator of a better or superior covenant. So Yeshua has a superior priesthood and he's the mediator of a superior covenant, a better covenant, which was constituted on what? Better promises. And what is the best of all the better promises? The promise of the indwelling Ruach HaKodesh, the indwelling set apart spirit. Amen. Who gives us the want to obey and the power to obey. Because the, re the reason the original covenant was broken was because their hearts were not circumcised. They didn't have the want to obey and they didn't have the power to obey. And they disobeyed. And because they disobeyed, they broke covenant with the Almighty. And when they broke covenant with the Almighty, ultimately, He sent them out of the land. First, Israel, the northern tribes, and then Yehuda and Benjamin. All right, are you still with me? Let's go to Hebrews chapter 4 and pick up with verse 14. And this tells us that Yeshua is the high priest of the new covenant. It says, therefore, since we have a great high priest, you could say the greatest high priest, the ultimate high priest, who has passed through the heavens. In other words, he's ascended to the right hand of the Father. He's passed through the heavens. He ascended to the right hand. He took his place as high priest in the heavenly tabernacle. It says, Yeshua, the son of Elohim, let us hold fast our confession, our confession of our belief in him. For we do not have a high priest unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who was tried or tested in all respects as we are apart from sin. So he was born into this world. He had a fleshly body. He lived in this life. He understands what living in this world is all about. He was tried by the evil one, just like we all are, except it was with him without sin. All right, so he is the sinless, spotless lamb of Elohim. All right, so in other words, without sinning, without transgressing Yah's Torah. That's what makes him the great high priest. He put on the pure white linen garments of sinlessness and righteousness so that he could make atonement for us. So when you read about Aharon dressing up in all white linen, think of Yeshua. Aharon had weakness. Aharon failed. Aharon missed the mark. 
Aharon had to offer a bull as an atonement for his sins because he was one who missed the mark. He was a sinner. But Yeshua is the great high priest having dressed up in the pure white linen of sinlessness and righteousness so that he could make an atonement through his blood for all of us. Amen. Hallelujah. So to be the sin offering, he had to be spotless or without sin. Verse 16, therefore, let us come boldly to the throne of favor in order to receive compassion or to be granted mercy. When do you need mercy? When you're in trouble, right? And find favor for timely help or help when we miss the mark. In other words, our compassionate high priest will intercede for us. You've heard me say it before. When he goes before the Father, after we've come to him, after we've confessed our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we come before him, we confess our sins. He takes our case before the Father. He advocates for us. He intercedes on our behalf. And he doesn't plead our case based on what we did or didn't do. He pleads the case based on what he accomplished when he died on the tree. And the Father has no other recourse except to grant forgiveness to us. And then we could rise up from that place of humility and confession and rejoice that we have a faithful and great high priest who intercedes on our behalf. Amen. And by the way, we're going to study the fact that he ever lives. That's the next point. He ever lives to make intercession for us. Now, now listen, some people will say the modern grace doctrine says this. Well, he died to forgive all of your sins, past, present, and future. And so they're all forgiven, and that gives a license. Because if you think that all your sins are forgiven, past, present, and future, then you can live any way you want to. Because this doctrine has done away with sin. Now, my question to you is, why would he have to be ever living? To make intercession for us. He has to be ever living because he's always on the job. Because we continue to sin. When we believe upon him originally and call upon his name. We are born again when we bow our knee to him. We come to Elohim with a desire to be obedient and live the way he wants us to live. And our past sins are forgiven Thank you, amen our past is eradicated our record is clear and then we're expected to live in the power of the spirit who gives us the want to and the power to be obedient Hallelujah. so I have something working in me that the original covenant people didn't have I have the want to a supernatural want to and not only that, I have the power to by his set-apart spirit. Because the best of the better promises in the new covenant is what? The indwelling set-apart spirit. The game changer. Amen. So there's something working in me that guarantees or helps to guarantee success in this marriage. Amen. When I say marriage, I'm talking about a marriage covenant that I have with Yah in Yeshua. Hallelujah. So, I don't have a desire to sin. I certainly don't premeditate my sin, like a lot of people in religion do. Because they think they have a get-out-of-jail-free card. They walk the aisle, repeated the prayer, then they can live anywhere they want to live. Because Jesus has forgiven all their sins, past, present, and future. I've heard of people who live in abominable lifestyles. Those that the scripture calls an abomination who say we don't have to change because Jesus paid for all our sins. So we can continue to live in this abomination because he paid for our sins. Now that's what religion will give you. So if, the, if there is no need for a high priest, then Yeshua doesn't need to ever live to make intercession for us. But the scripture says he does. He ever lives to make intercession for us. Now, why is that important? Because even though I have no desire to sin, 
People say, aren't you tempted to go out and drink and party and smoke dope and, you know, have sex out of marriage and all that? Well, you know, honestly, no. I'm not suffering with those things. I'm not saying that they're not a problem with some people who believe. Amen. But that's because every day I'm walking in the ways of Yeshua. I'm trusting in the ministry of the set-apart spirit. Now, what if, what if I miss the mark in some way? An attitude, a thought, a word. Amen? When the Spirit has His way in the believer, then we feel that conviction immediately. So what do you do when you feel that conviction? You go straight to your high priest who's on the job. He hadn't resigned. He hadn't retired. He's ever living to make intercession. And we confess our sins. So we drop down in humility. We confess our sins. We say, I'd rather die than to commit that sin again. I mean, that's the depth of, of our, our heart's sadness and grief over what we did. We have true contrition. But then we have to know that our high priest is on the job. And he goes and he pleads our case according to what he accomplished on the tree when he died in our place. And then we have to know that we're forgiven. And when we know that we're forgiven, we can get up from that place of confession and contrition and repentance and rejoice. At that point, that is the greatest point of rejoicing. I mean, that will make you a praiser if you understand what it's all about. At that point, you're getting up and you're rejoicing and you're praising and you're thanking that you have a faithful high priest and a great high priest who ever lives to make intercession. Amen? All right. Well, I preached that one already, but let's get into the scripture. Yeshua is a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. In other words, he's a priest who lives eternally to make intercession for us. Let's look at the verses. Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 1. For every priest taken from among men is appointed on behalf of men in matters relating to Elohim. All right, so this is talking about the Levitical priesthood and the appointments that are made. To offer both gifts and offerings for sin, being able to have a measure of feeling for those not knowing. That means that your sin is not premeditated. Amen and being led astray, since he himself is also surrounded by weakness. In other words, he sins as well. All right. Verse 3, And on account of this, he has to offer for sins, as for the people, so also for himself. Haven't we talked about that already, that Aharon had to offer for himself? All right. And no one obtains this esteem for himself. In other words, no one chooses himself as a priest. But he who is called by Elohim, even as Aharon also was. Now, let's look at verse 5. So also the Messiah did not extol himself to become high priest. So Yeshua didn't choose to become high priest on his own. But it was he, it was Elohim, who said to him, who said to Yeshua, You are my son, today I have brought you forth. Now, that's a quotation of Psalm 2 in verse 7. And he also says in another place, this is Psalm 110 in verse 4, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. All right? So the Almighty himself speaks to Yeshua and calls him to be a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek who in the days of his flesh, speaking of Yeshua, when he was alive before his execution, when he had offered up prayers and petitions with strong crying and tears to him who was able to save him from death. So Yeshua was praying to the Father and was heard because of his reverent fear. Though being a son, he learned obedience by what he suffered. And having been perfected, perfected through his suffering and his death and his resurrection, he became the causer of everlasting deliverance to all those who say they believe upon him. Is that what that says? No. What does it say? No. 
to all those obeying him. Having been designated by Elohim a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. All right, another place it says that that was the oath that the Almighty made. All right, because Yeshua was not of the tribe of Levi or Levi, Levi, you may have heard it said, but he was of the tribe of Judah. And there is no one from Judah who serves in the priesthood. So the Almighty himself makes an oath, and it's in the scripture, that when Yeshua arrives on the scene, he's going to become the great high priest, the faithful high priest, forever in the order of Melchizedek. So quickly, what does the scripture say about Melchizedek? Hebrews chapter 7, verse 3, about Melchizedek, it said, he's without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but having been made like the son of Elohim, remains a priest for all time. People want to say Yeshua was like Melchizedek, but the scripture says Melchizedek was like Yeshua. Melchizedek is a type, a picture, a shadow of Yeshua. And what's said in scripture about Melchizedek is that he lives forever. All right. So Yeshua lives forever. He's the ever living high priest. Now look at Hebrews chapter 7, picking up with verse 23. And indeed, those that became priests, the sons of Aharon, were many because they were prevented by death from continuing. In other words, they would serve and, uh, and they would be replaced upon their death. All right, They couldn't continue because they would die. So they'd be replaced. But he, Yeshua, because he remains forever, forever like Melchizedek, has an unchangeable priesthood. An unchangeable priesthood. What does that mean? Does that mean that it's just symbolic? Does that mean that he was the high priest for a short season and now he's no longer high priest? No. His priesthood is unchangeable. Therefore, he is also able to save completely. Now think about it. Salvation. A lot of times religion teaches that salvation is walking an aisle and repeating a prayer. That it's that simple. That somebody walks an aisle and repeats a prayer. They don't say anything about what kind of life you're supposed to live. Just walk the aisle and repeat the prayer. Right? But this says that Yeshua is able to save completely. Why? Because salvation is a lifelong process. Yeshua is not going to be replaced in your lifetime. He lives forever. He's able to save you completely. Amen. He's able to act as high priest on your behalf all through your life and your children's lives and your grandchildren's lives. Amen. Because he is a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Therefore, he is also able to save completely those who draw near to Elohim through him, ever living to make intercession for them. Again, that's not talking about prayer. It's not talking about he's praying for you. How many of you have heard that? You've heard somebody teach that Yeshua or Jesus is up in heaven praying for you. Right. All right. That's not what this is talking about. To make intercession, he's acting as high priest. Amen. He's pleading your case when you come humbly before him. He's pleading your case on your behalf before his father based on what he accomplished when he died in our place Amen. on the tree. Amen. He's making intercession. 1 Timothy 2 and 5 says, For there is one Elohim, everybody say one Elohim. one Elohim, and one mediator between Elohim and men. And who is that mediator? The man, Messiah Yeshua. So Yeshua is our mediator between Elohim and us. 1 John 2 and 1 says, My little children, I write this to you, so that you do not sin. That's the will of Abba, that we not sin. And if anyone sins, speaking of after receiving Yeshua, we have an intercessor with the Father, Yeshua Messiah, a righteous one. 
And he himself is an atoning offering for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for all the world. So, again, he is our ever-living high priest, intercessor. And this scripture tells us that he is our atoning sin offering. So we want to talk a little bit about that. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 8, starting with verse 3. Yeshua is our sin offering. For every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and slaughters or sacrifices. So it was also necessary for this one, speaking of Yeshua, to have somewhat or to have something to offer. So Yeshua, as high priest, needed to have something to offer. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, starting with verse 21. For he, speaking of Yah, made him, Yeshua, who knew no sin, he was the sinless, spotless one, to be sin for us, he became our sin offering, so that in him we might become the righteousness of Elohim. So Yeshua offers himself. He offered himself on the tree. He died in our place. He took our sin upon himself. He paid our death penalty. He was and is our sin offering. Can you say amen? amen. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 26 for it was fitting that we should have such a high priest. Listen to all these descriptive words of Yeshua. Kind. Are you glad he's kind? Innocent or guiltless. Undefiled. Having been separated from sinners or set apart. And exalted above the heavens. Who does not need as those high priests to offer up slaughter offerings day by day. First for his own sins. Because Yeshua didn't have any sins. And then for those of the people, for this he did once for all when he offered up himself. All right, so he is our faithful high priest and our atoning sin offering. Keep that in mind. Hebrews 9 and verse 11, but Messiah, having become a high priest of the coming good matters, through the greater and more perfect tent, speaking of the heavenly tabernacle, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, entered into the most set-apart place. So what did Yeshua do when he offered himself as the sin offering? He did exactly what Aharon did. He took his own blood into the most set-apart place in the tabernacle, in heaven and he sprinkled his own blood on the mercy seat of the ark of the covenant because he is our atoning sin offering and as high priest he offered his own blood hallelujah, hallelujah. it says in verse 12 well go ahead and rejoice it says in verse 12, entered into the most set apart place once for all, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood. The scripture tells us that the blood of bulls and goats cannot remove sin. All right. So Yom Kippurim, day of coverings under the original covenant, the innocent died for the guilty. The innocent animals died for guilty human beings. And there was a blood covering made. All right, the covering of the blood of bulls and goats cannot remove sins. It only covers sins. And so those original covenant people of Yah who believed and died in belief, and we know there were, there are definitely some of those, they had to wait until the blood of Yeshua was shed for their sins to be removed. Because only the blood of Yeshua can remove sin. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, having obtained everlasting or eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkled the defiled, that's under the original covenant, sets apart for the cleansing of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of the Messiah. Can you thank the Almighty for the blood of the Messiah? How much more, hallelujah, shall the blood of the Messiah, 
who through the everlasting spirit offered himself unblemished or without sin to Elohim, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living Elohim. And then verse 24, for Messiah has not entered into the set-apart place made by hand or a man-made tabernacle, figures of the true, in other words, a type of the, the true tabernacle in heaven, but into the heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of Elohim on our behalf, not that he should offer himself, he's the sin offering, often or over and over again, as the high priest enters into the set-apart place year by year with blood not his own, in other words, with the blood of the sin offerings. For if so, he would have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the offering of himself. And as it awaits men to die once and after this the judgment, so also the Messiah, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, shall appear a second time apart from sin to those waiting for him unto deliverance. All right, so when he returns, then Yom Kippurim is pointing towards judgment. So he came the first time as the suffering servant, dying in our place. But when he returns the second time, he's coming back as conquering king. Amen. Amen. And he's going to then judge Israel and he's going to judge the nations of the world as well. All right. So let's go to Hebrews chapter 13. Verse 11, and this is going to show us that Yeshua, our sin offering, was executed outside the gate. You remember what it said about the bodies of the, the bull and the goat, the sin offerings that were taken outside the gate and were burned? Notice what it says in Hebrews 13, 11 about Yeshua. For the bodies of those beasts, the bull and the goat, whose blood is brought into the set-apart place by the high priest for sin, in other words, the sin offerings, are burned outside the camp. And so Yeshua also suffered outside the gate. So dying on the tree outside the city gate to set apart the people with his own blood, let us then go to him outside the camp bearing his reproach. And so the writer of the book of Hebrews saw the fact that Yeshua was executed on the tree outside the city gates as a, as a fulfillment of the type of, and the shadow and the picture of what Elohim, through Moshe, commanded Aharon to do with the bodies of the sin offerings. He was to take them outside the camp and burn them. And so Yeshua suffered outside the gate. He fulfilled that. Yeshua was also our scapegoat. He was the one who bore our sins away. Isaiah 53 and verse 6 says, We all like sheep went astray went astray in our sins. Each one of us has turned to his own way, and Yah has laid on him, laid on Yeshua, the crookedness of us all. So Yeshua is our scapegoat. He's the one that received the sin of the world upon himself. Verse 11, he, speaking of Yah, would see the result of the suffering of his life, of Yeshua's suffering, and be satisfied. Through his knowledge, my righteous servant, Yeshua, makes many righteous, and he bears their crookednesses. So who bears our crookednesses? Yeshua, who is the scapegoat as well. Verse 12, therefore I, speaking of Yah, give him a portion among the great. He's our great high priest, and he divides the spoil with the strong because he poured out his being unto death, and he was counted with the transgressors. He was executed between two thieves and bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. All right. So we're coming down to the close of this message. But I want you to see something interesting in John chapter 1 and verse 29. It says, On the next day, Yohanan saw Yeshua coming toward him and said, See, 
the Lamb of Elohim. All right, so Yeshua is our Passover Lamb. That's a reference to the Passover Lamb. Who takes away or who bears away the sin of the world. So he's our Passover Lamb and our scapegoat who bears away our sins. So he actually spoke of both of them. He's our Passover lamb and he's our scapegoat who bears away our sins. And then finally, I want to read a portion out of the book of Revelation. And uh, this is just to put our hearts in a place of worship and adoration and gratitude and praise to Yeshua, who is our Passover lamb who is our sin offering, who is our scapegoat, and who is our faithful, great high priest who ever lives to make intercession for us. All right, Revelation chapter 5, beginning with verse 6. And I looked and saw in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures and in the midst of the elders a lamb standing as having been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of Elohim sent out into all the earth. And he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him sitting on the throne, speaking of Elohim. And when he took the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls filled with incense, which are the prayers of the set apart ones. And they sang a renewed or a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain and have redeemed us to Elohim by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation and made us sovereigns and priests to our Elohim. Uh, another translation would be a kingdom of priests to our Elohim. And we shall reign upon the earth. And that's a quote of Daniel 7, verses 18 through 27. And then verse 11 and I looked and I heard the voice of many messengers or many angels around the throne and the living creatures and the elders and the number of them was myriads of myriads or ten thousands of ten thousands and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice worthy is the lamb having been slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and respect and esteem and blessing. And every creature which is in the heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them, I heard saying to him sitting on the throne and to the Lamb, be the blessing and the respect and the esteem and the might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the 24 elders fell down and bowed before him who lives forever and ever. Hallelujah. Praise Yah. Praise Yah. You see how important it is to have a foundation in the Torah, to be able to understand this great salvation, this tremendous redemption that we have in Yeshua and all that Yeshua is to us. Yeshua opened up their minds. He opened up the minds of his disciples to understand the scriptures. And he said, the Torah and the prophets and the writings were written about me. Isn't it amazing? In all of that Yom Kippurim service, all of those different elements, they all point to Yeshua. He's not just our high priest. He's a great high priest. He's the ultimate high priest. Amen. And he ever lives to make intercession for us. Hallelujah. Shalom, shalom. Welcome, you guys. What a, what a really good teaching from Gary Simons. I, in my opinion, one of, the, one of the best Hebrew teachers on the Internet right now. Um, solid teaching. Well, from about five years ago. You guys, um, Tonight begins Yom Kippur and begins with uh, most people's fast for 24 hours. And then it concludes at the sundown um, tomorrow. So just keep that in mind. I apologize. I haven't been able to get, you know, teachings out to you guys. So I wanted to at least get something out. So 
um, we can memorialize this day and uh, commemorate what is going on. And of course, if you're going by the lunar solar calendar um, and, and you follow your Bible, you know that these feasts are determined by the moon. So if, there, if there's no regard to the moon and just, you know, you're on a fixed calendar, just know um, you're on the wrong calendar. Uh, the father is very clear in his scriptures and says that these feasts are determined by the moon. The Moedim is determined by the moon, Psalm 104, 19. So I hope you got something out of this, uh, this teaching. This is from Gary Simon from Triumph and Truth. Uh, please go and subscribe to his channel. He's one of the most excellent teachers on the internet. And um, uh, I wanted to share that with you today. So don't forget that tonight at sundown begins Yom Kippur. And so that's when you start your, uh, your fast for the feast. Shalom to you. We'll see you in the next video.